Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, again, my name is Eric Scholar. I'm Director of International Logistics for the Home Depot. It's my pleasure to be able to speak to you today about Home Depot and our uh, global import supply chain. I have about 10 slides for you. Uh, the first few will go very quickly. I'm going to give you one slide on Home Depot, just a uh, general overview. Uh, a few slides on our import supply chain, and then really the fun part here, a couple of slides on our requirements for our service providers, uh, which I include both our ports and our ocean carriers. Okay, uh, Home Depot, we've got over 2,200 stores, over 300,000 associates. We have stores in four countries, United States, Canada, Mexico, China, and we also have stores in uh, offshore islands like Guam, Puerto Rico, uh, St. Thomas. Uh, last year we did over 1.3 billion transactions, 68 billion in revenue, and we ended, uh, we have ten, over $10.6 billion in inventory. And that'll uh, be a factor you wanna remember for later. Uh, as far as our import supply chain, we buy product from uh, manufacturers that operate in over 40 countries, uh, pretty much every, everywhere in the world. You can see we buy a lot out of South America, an awful lot out of Asia and South Asia, uh, some out of Europe, some out of uh, Arab, or, um, the Middle East, and even Australia. Uh, of our volume, over, over three-fourths of it actually comes from China, uh, where I, I didn't mention previously, we're the third largest container importer in the United States. Uh, three, over three-quarters of that comes from China. It enters the U.S. through one of, uh, primarily through one of four ports, so about 90% of our volume comes in through one of either Seattle, Tacoma, L.A. Long Beach, Savannah, or New York, New Jersey. About uh, a third of that volume actually currently moves through the Panama Canal, and I know there's lots of talk about Suez. Uh, in recent years, uh, uh, the amount of freight that we actually have moved through the Suez has increased. Uh, slow steaming has contributed to that as it's made some of the transits uh, coming from the west, you know, coming eastbound uh, longer, and so the transits coming westbound through the Suez have been uh, more tr attractive comparatively. Uh, our volume, we actually are fairly attractive to most ocean carriers. A lot of our volume is counter-cyclical. So what happens uh, sort of in general in the industry is, you know, there's a whole bunch of freight buildup, a whole bunch of ship volume moving. Uh, third quarter, fourth quarter in preparation for Christmas and the holiday season. Uh, and our volume actually drops off shortly before then. And I'll start with the left side of the graph. We ship patios, grills, air, conditionings, air conditioners, and fans very heavily in the January, February, March time frame. And this is when a lot of other uh, importers aren't shipping much at all. So that's very attractive freight for ocean carriers. This graph, a little bit betrayed here because of Chinese New Year. That's what, uh, that's what that dip is from. But other than that, we have a lot of heavy volume in off-peak times, and that's attractive. And then uh, toward the peak time, July, August, September, we have a, a spike where we're bringing in our own holiday product, but then our spike drops off uh, much faster than the rest of the industry, so we're not putting as much pressure on carrier and port infrastructure as some of the other uh, providers are. So again, point just being that our freight's fairly attractive. Value of our goods, uh, we don't move very much at all via air. Uh, you know, our, the value of our containers uh, can be very low. In some cases, we're shipping tile. You know, it's really just pressed dirt. Um, and so it, it doesn't make sense to fly that stuff. It's very, very heavy, and it's, uh, it's not very expensive. Uh, we also do ship some more expensive things like appliances and other things where uh, that's not necessarily true. Uh, but as a general rule, uh, when we are looking at, uh, at importing product, we try and put it on the water as long as we can possibly, as close to get it as close to its destination as we can on the water because the water transportation is generally cheaper. Uh, when it eventually lands in the United States, we have uh, 15 distribution centers that we actually operate uh, uh, that stock our import product. We have 60 facilities across the United States in total, but not all of them stock import product. We have, ha happen to have two of these stocking facilities in Georgia, one in Savannah, and one in McDonough, which is south of the airport here. We actually have six facilities in Georgia altogether, but only two of them stock the product. So uh, of these 15 buildings, they range in size from 600,000 to 1.6 million square feet. Uh, they have SKU count anywhere from 1,100 to 2,700 SKUs. Uh, and down here you can see just a picture of, of some of the product in, in the facility. So uh, we have a, a very large group of folks whose job is to determine how much product to buy, when to buy it, when to make sure it's in the DC, and when to get, make sure that it's in the store. Uh, the, the key factors that they decide, or that they use to decide how much to order and when uh, for import product are lead time and lead time variability. So how long does it take to get here, and how variable are those deliveries around when you're expecting to get them? Uh, so, uh, you know, holding inventory, running these operations facilities, they're very expensive. Uh, the more square footage you need, the, uh, the more expensive it gets. Uh, the objective is to satisfy the needs of the stores and our customers while holding the, the least amount of inventory to do that. Uh, and again, that'll be um, more relevant here in the next few slides. So that's pretty much on the Home Depot. Uh, I wanted to talk again briefly about our kind of our two provider groups, one being ports and one being the ocean carriers. Uh, and talk about what's important to us. So as far as ports go, uh, a few things are very important. One is uh, diversity. 
We think given all the different uh, things that can happen that cause disruption within a supply chain, it's very important to have a diversity of ports in use and active use. And you saw we have about four ports that, through which we bring most of our product. We actually do business or you know, have containers unload in uh, I think around nine or ten ports uh, over the course of a year, but most of it's coming through those four. Another important thing is visibility. Uh, so uh, it's often been a struggle for shippers. Uh, they, they know where the product is while it's on the vessel. They might know where it is or where, uh, when it actually um, is on a drayage carrier or when it arrives at their DC, but it, uh, the port has always been something of a black hole for a lot of shippers in terms of not really knowing where their container was or where their product was while it was in this, uh, between the ship and the truck. So uh, maintaining that visibility, working with ports that can provide that kind of visibility is, is important. Uh, next one is turn time. This is, you know, the, the vessel arrived on Monday. I don't want to wait till Wednesday or Thursday to get my container. I'd like it on Monday if I could have it. Uh, the faster the a port can turn, uh, a terminal can turn the container once it arrives, the more, uh, the more valuable that is to us, of course. And lastly, and I, uh, I honestly think most importantly, um, is focused on the end customer. So uh, I will tell you, I'm relatively new into the world of international, and uh, I've been spent uh, a lot of times over, over the past, past few months visiting different ports and talking to different port operators and terminal operators, and was frankly pretty surprised and shocked to, to see that many of these guys see the ocean carriers as their customer. And as a shipper and as the guy who ultimately is paying for the freight, I, I think that's completely backwards. Uh, the shipper is really the customer. The carrier is only providing the service on behalf of the customer for the port or for the terminal operator to not see that and not uh, take that kind of approach um, is disturbing. And I would tell you, uh, there are different ports across the country that don't have the shipper as the end customer when, in terms of how they operate their businesses, and there are a few that actually do so. And uh, this is going to sound a little suspicious because we're in Georgia and because uh, the GPA guy's up here, but I think <laughs> the, uh, the Port of Savannah is probably is one of the best that I've seen in terms of, of taking this approach. Uh, and I honestly, it, it, this is uh, an unbiased opinion. I, I just met Cliff today. He didn't ask me to say this, but uh, Port of Savannah has really done a great job of saying, you know what, the shipper who's who, who my customer is, the carriers are only coming here because the shippers are paying them to come here. Yes, the, the carrier relationship is important. Uh, the terminal operation is important, but the shipper who is, who's paying, is who's paying the freight. And so we need to structure our port operations knowing that, knowing that turn time is important, knowing that visibility is important, knowing that when a shipper calls and says, hey, I need this container, or I need this, uh, your, your hours extended, or something different happen operationally, that they're listening to us and not saying, hey, I've got to go talk to the carrier. They're the ones who, uh, who are paying my bills. Uh, so Savannah does a great job of that. They're not the only ones that have a customer mentality, but uh, uh, again, there, there are ports that don't operate with that. So my plea would be if you are a port operator or if you are a, a terminal operator and you don't have this model, you really need to think about maybe talk to the guys in Savannah and figure out how you can uh, adapt and modify. And I think it will end up attracting more freight through your port. If you're an ocean carrier, I would ask you to talk to your terminal manager, your terminal uh, companies and uh, have them uh, think about this as well. So I happen to, uh, just as an example of that, uh, this is an overhead shot of the Port of Savannah. The box in red here is something that we set up with them way, going way back to when they were founded. This is called the Rapid Dispatch Yard. This is a yard that they set up for us and a few other very high volume shippers where our freight is pre-mounted and set for us as it comes off the vessel. So it makes it very easy for us to come in, get our stuff and get out, which is again, very important for us being a retailer. Uh, and again, this is not something that they're probably going to want to offer to everyone out there. We have a lot of volume. Uh, <laughs> talk to Cliff after the show if you're interested. <laughs> just kidding. But uh, I did want to point it out just because it is a great example of a port who's taking the end customer uh, in, into account when they're, when they're structuring their operations. So on to the ocean carrier side, um, in addition to cost, which is uh, obviously a key component of who we award our, uh, how we award our ocean service contracts, we have several other things that are important to us. One is on-time delivery performance. This is, did you arrive on the day you told us you were going to be there when we booked the freight with you? Second one is, uh, sort of relates to the point I meant, made earlier, which is demonstrated lever leverage at the terminal. If, if, uh, if we need to get a container out of the terminal, we need you to be able to press and get that, uh, make that happen for us. And then lastly, kind of a, a number of things bundle into one line here, call it capacity execution. This is, are you, you told us you're going to take, you know, 50 containers a week out of this certain port. Are you taking all 50 consistently? Are you letting our freight roll? Or are you doing what you said you were going to do? And these are all things that are very, very important. Uh, and as we make our contract awards, and we just finished this about 30 days ago, we take all of these different um, aspects into account. Now, again, being fairly new into the international world, um, I have to just say uh, that I was, uh, 
frankly quite shocked and disappointed to see uh, what the actual level of performance for ocean carriers is related to the first item, the on-time delivery performance. Um, I've got some numbers for you, and I don't know if they're going to be too legible for you uh, from here. But this is these are this is data from Drury, which is an industry uh, organization that publishes this sort of uh, this and other kinds of information about the ocean carrier industry. Uh, from 2010 fourth quarter, uh, the best in the industry was 70 percent on time. The best in the industry. Uh, if you look here in the middle, uh, I removed the names to protect the innocent here, but most of the carriers are around 50 percent, which means, you know, if you're buying service, you flip a coin. That's whether or not you're going to get what you actually paid for. Uh, and uh, the, the uh, Q1 2011 numbers just came out, and I think the overall industry average was 51%. So that's really, really bad. Uh, and I honestly, I, I believe that some of this is self-inflicted. I don't think shippers have um, uh, kind of lived up to their end of the bargain in terms of demanding on-time service. I don't think a lot of shippers have actually decided to, that it's worth paying to differentiate your service. Uh, but so uh, to collectively, we have to fix this. Uh, I would tell you, our freight, we've got, you know, I mentioned tile. Tile, you know, uh, if it's going to be an extra day or two, we're probably not going to do anything to expedite paying, uh, you know, getting that. If it's going to be a day or two late, we're not going to expedite it. It's tile. Like I said, it's very low cost, very low value. Uh, but we have other product lines where it is absolutely critical. And so what we want to be able to do as shippers is sort of differentiate as we're making our contract awards. i got some lanes I want to run. Um, I want to pay more to get better service. I have some lanes that maybe that's not quite so important. Um, based on these numbers, I would tell you we don't really have much of a choice at all. No matter who we go with, we're not going to be very well do very well on, on terms of on time. So we've made this a priority at Home Depot, uh, and we've started talking to our carriers about it. We made our awards this year, uh, reflecting okay which carriers are doing really well because we can see that within our own data. We have enough. Uh, we make enough uh, sh uh, container moves each year. We have a good internal source of data. We also use the jury data on lanes we don't have or carriers we don't do business with to kind of say. If we are going to buy service from this carrier on this lane, what can we in in expect in terms of on-time service? And we make our awards that way. Uh, we've started talking to a lot of the carriers, and I, I frankly think, I don't think this was uh, necessarily um, intentional that their, their scores are this bad, but frankly, most many carriers weren't even really looking at on-time service. It was just sort of a, you know, we'll do our best to get it there. We're, we're generally pretty close to, on to the date. What I don't have on here, it's 70% might be the best carrier on here to, uh, to their ETA. If you go out to two days, past their ETA, they're closer to 90%. So it gets pretty much better quickly, uh, but it's still not quite good enough. And uh, so through our conversations with carriers, I think they're starting to take notice and they're starting to change how they run internally. And we're, it's starting to pay off for us. And the hope would be if you're a shipper in the room, you'd help us uh, make this change in the industry happen. I think it's best, it's good for the carrier industry, it's good for the shipper industry, it's good for, for all of us. With that, that's my last slide. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Mr. Schwartz. Thank you.